Another thing I've heard you discuss is when you initially started practicing and working with individuals and thinking that you knew about trauma, but maybe not to the extent, obviously, that you do now. And that I don't know what word you use. I don't know if you use triggering or what, but basically that you were having patients not come back and you realize that maybe you weren't being as effective as possible. Could you touch upon that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was being harmful. Mm -hmm. I was trained and influenced from the outside in a way such that I didn't know a critical reality of the science regarding the brain and trauma, that if people have legit PTSD, because you can be traumatized in the broader term of the word trauma clinically and not develop PTSD or mm -hmm. complex PTSD or some other related thing, like there are related personality disorders. But for those who do have those physiological and also personality reactions to the trauma that they had years and years ago, if you just go headlong into having them recall the memories of trauma, mm -hmm. although it, there's a little bit of helpfulness that's happening, the amount of distress mm -hmm. they will experience from the exposure of something that they, because a, a hallmark of PTSD is to avoid the memories. And mm -hmm. there's good reasons why they avoid, because when they remember or they're reminded of the memory, they have massive spikes in distress and possible dissociation. And then from those like chronic spikes in stress, people will become a version of depressed. They will uh, avoid a lot of things in life. They might even avoid opening up. They, they'll shame themselves. They'll avoid being close to others. The syndrome of PTSD all stems from that spike in the stress that happens over time. Mm -hmm. And so it might seem like the right thing to do is to have people talk about their traumas. It is a a trope at some point. It's like the stereotypical therapy session is someone talks about their traumas. And I was actually trained to lean into that, but mm -hmm. for people who had actual, and so for many of my clients, that was fine. They, they could talk about their traumas because they didn't have PTSD and then it would work out okay because it would be validating and processing all the good things of therapy. But for people who have PTSD, they can have such a spike that it'll either just turn them off to therapy or it'll throw them into like three months of symptoms that could even lead to suicide, by the way. And they're like, therapy sucks because it makes me feel worse. <laughs> I feel worse about going to therapy. And so there have to be a lot of measures taken by experts in PTSD and complex PTSD before you even begin to talk about your traumas. And and that could take five weeks or it could take five years. It really just depends on the client and the course of therapy and whatnot. What was your process in realizing that you were being harmful? Like, how did that come about? Well, I started noticing that there was one particular client that was very noticeable that I was working with her for years and we had a really great relationship and she was a pretty easygoing person. And we had been through some, because it started out as family therapy with her kids mm -hmm. who were very, had were acting out a lot. And there's a lot of ups and downs through therapy. We'd been through a lot of trials. And so it wasn't like we hadn't, our relationship hadn't been tested before. And then she sits down one session and she says, there's something about my childhood that I've been avoiding talking about that I've never told anybody. And I mm -hmm. feel like it's time I tell you. And at the time, I remember exactly where I was and where I was sitting in the office and that it was sunny out. <laughs> and I remember thinking, this is the golden profound. Yeah, this is where <laughs> all therapists want to eventually yeah. get to. It's the fruit of one's labor. And, she, you know, so she went into a difficult childhood, early childhood story, and it felt good. And she was processing it well. And I was right there with her and the session ended well. And then she canceled somehow. I don't remember how exactly the next session. And I literally never heard from her again. Mm -hmm. And I thought to this day. Yeah. Mm. And, and that doesn't happen that my sort of practice, that's not normal. So it always perplexed me. And I even have some, a gift from her on my wall behind me. You can't really see it from where, but she, on the way up to my office, I, I had this Japanese maple tree and she had taken these, these leaves one day on the way home and actually 
had dried them and pressed them and put them into this frame. And it's, it was, it's a very special thing. And, and so it always plagued me. I was like, what happened there? That's just, and it, that, that's not a pleasant thing for mm -hmm. Especially some you've been working with for so long. Yeah. And I then later when I had future mentors and would have future exposure to literature, I started to absorb more information and the science and how actual exposure, prolonged exposure therapy works and the, the principles regarding that within behaviorism. And again, I had a mentor that had done this work before. And so it takes a lot. It's complicated. There, there's a lot of details. Every client is different. And then with that mentor, I had clients who had PTSD and I would, and complex PTSD. And as I was treating them, although I was, I had newly acquired the science and understood it, applying it is actually really complicated. And so working with the mentor and trial and error through that whole thing for years, eventually I concluded that in the past I was mm -hmm. led astray and had harmed a client and maybe others.